Hey, and welcome to our round three recap of the 2024 candidates. It's GM Max here, and let's jump right into the games. Now, this round was admittedly not quite as exciting as round two with all four decisive games, but it certainly had its highlights. And in this first game here, we see Abasov playing against Nakamura, where, you know, these players both lost in, in round two, so it kind of makes sense that, you know, they decide just to play, like, a very solid system where... You know, Black with the A6 Chebenenko approach is happy to, you know, recycle the light squared bishop as we saw. Because, yeah, the remaining bishop is well placed with the pawns on the light squares. And white as well, you could say, is probably not playing the most critical way. You know, moves like rook c1, for example, are considered a little bit more dangerous. So that if black goes bishop g4, then you're able to break the pin with knight e5, which is not the case when you already played e5 as such. But the way the game played out, yeah, both sides were pretty happy just to play very solid. Neither side really rocking the boat here. It's sometimes players will try to put some pressure with, like, bring the knight around this way, or Black will try to do the same thing himself. But here, knight a4 wouldn't be so well-timed, because up to queen a5, you know, knight c5 does allow Black to take on a2 and, you know, basically hold its own in, in this sort of way. So White just played very solid, queen f3. Just uh, bring the queen towards the uh, the uh, queen side in a sense. Uh, also note, black doesn't really want to play a move like b5 in such a hurry. As after a4, this pawn would become a little bit of a weakness, as it were. So, black just plays knight d7, queen d2, knight e7, and the players basically just chop off a lot of pieces. Like, just take, take, not a whole lot really happening here. Why well, can't really use the bishop against the knight because of the, the structure just being very locked up. And yeah, if you are enjoying this video so far, do make sure to leave a like and to consider subscribing. But yeah, the players very soon just repeated moves and yeah, the game just, just ended in a draw by repetition. Since they're not allowed to agree to a draw before move 40, that's how they yeah, do it. Just do a free fold in a dead equal position. The good news is that the other games were quite a bit more interesting than this one. And for the next game, we're going to see a game between Alareza Ferruja against Fabiano Caruana. And Caruana normally has a very good record against Ferruja, but it is true Ferruja also has the white pieces. Knight 6 already a little bit of a surprise here. You know, E5 was in a choice in Caruana Abasov from the previous round, and, you know, G6 and. To a lesser extent, e6 are kind of considered the main lines here. Whereas knight f6, yeah, is a bit of a, a different approach where, you know, one away white can play is to take and you know, just have this very strategic position playing against black's weakened structure. But the move Ferusha played in knight c3 is the main line. And now Kawana played the move knight d4. And it used to be thought that this line was actually very good for white because of this move of knight g5 and you're know, having some tricks connected with queen f3 and the weakness of f7 however modern engines have shown that after a move like f6 the black's actually doing reasonably okay here like if knight e4 black can just go f5 and and yeah it turns out position is is actually not so bad for black in uh in this case like despite being a pawn down black gets quite uh quite decent play with the bishop pair which Fair enough, this actually happened in a, a Carolina Carlson game where Carolina won with white, but Carlson was more or less doing fine out of the opening in the uh, Rising End game. But yeah, this explains why Carolina decided to play to move c4 instead. If I remember, I believe Barucha has also played castles and have gone for this move order, but yeah, in the game, Barucha decides to, you know, just keep the tension, like not exchanging the, the knights as such. But plays to move knight c3, trying to keep more pieces on the board. To which Caruana played the move of d5, which actually sent Ferruja into quite a long think. You know, maybe he was expecting more to move d6 in, in this position. But the move d5, yeah, gives white some different options available. You know, there's the option not just to take on Passant as white did in the game, but you, know, you could also play d4 and just maximize the tension in the center to try and sort of sack a pawn, but make use of your your lead in development in a sense. And also CD5 is a move, although I do think with the bishop pair and the D5 outpost, black really shouldn't have any any problems at all here. 
So Ferocious played e takes d6, and you know, the move queen d6 strikes me as the most strategically reliable. So I'm planning to go for a fiend keto after that in castle. But ed6 was played in the game, which you know, it does leave the d6 pawn a little bit weak, but it's not the easiest thing to, to exploit the backward pawn. Uh, white played the move bishop f4, just putting some, some pressure here. Uh, black played the move knight to e6 to, to deal with that. Um, note, by the way, black does play bishop g4 that, you know, in this case we will be able to play some little tricks like takes and, you know, this knight's under fire, so black has to take with a bishop. And then bishop d6 would allow white to, to win a pawn as such. So this is the top explanation why knight e6 was preferred. Yeah, it shuts in the bishop, but it's not such a, a big problem at the moment. You know, black can play move like b6 if he wants to free the bishop that way, or, you know, in the game, black just played knight c7 and kind of just accepted the loss of tempo, making the point that, well, maybe white doesn't have a much more useful move than bishop f4 in any case. White played the move h3 here, just anticipating any bishop g4 pins, all seems pretty natural. Bishop f5, rook e1, rook e8, and yeah, in this position, I think the move queen d2 probably in retrospect, Lex Black a little bit off the hook here. Whereas, you know, putting the queen on b3 instead is a little bit more dynamic. You know, the rook comes to d1, and I think white still has a little bit of pressure to potentially work with here. Um, one interesting point about this position is that you can even actually let white take on b7, because if white does take, you do have rook b8, and, you know, it turns out this actually ends up just being a draw by, by repetition, because, you know, if you do play queen c6, the queen is going to get trapped with bishop d7. It's just one thing that's worth pointing out. Like, queen b3, the idea isn't to take immediately, but to kind of, you know, make it that at some point black will have to deal with it as such. But after queen d2, Caruana played a, a very precise move here in the move of d5, just opening up the center for his bishop pair advantage. After cd5, nice intermediate move c4, not allowing white to win a pawn with knight d5 and, and d takes c5 as such. We have c4 black and get the pawn back on his terms. And I mean, for the rest of the game, both sides more or less played pretty well here. Like knight takes c3, take queen e7, and you know, white can take a pawn as, as he did in the game, but the bishop pair just gives black this very martial or Petrov-like compensation. Um, you know, if queen b3, even bishop c2 is a, a little bit of a harassment to the, the white pieces. But after queen b5, yeah, turns out this ending is also just fine for black. Where black has the bishop pair, he can just pile everything into d4 to often regain that pawn as such. Um, you know, white could play rook d1 and try to push the pawn where... I don't think it changes the final result, but maybe just gave white some more chances to win the game in comparison. Though admittedly, I think after, say, b6 and rook e5, I think that, you know, in a position like this, white's extra pawn is of... A relatively limited value, let's say. Uh, you know, the bishop can just sit on d5 and it's it's not easy for white to make progress. I like this approach a lot better than take on f3 and you know giving up your bishop there just to to double their pawns. But in the game, white went d5, going for this immediately. Black being a pawn down was relatively happy to you know exchange of pawns and open things up even more for the pair of bishops. Bishop e6, rook a7. This is all pretty standard. You know, the pawn's under attack. Black defends with rook a8. And yeah, again, the strong bishops and the active rook do give black full compensation. Well, at least we can say drawing compensation. So a3, h6, also quite precise, just making that look for the king. Rook e1, rook to d8. Bishop e5 is trying to anticipate the long diagonal pressure. Rook d5, again... Arwana just plays this position very, very well. Doesn't really give Farouja any real chances to leverage his extra pawn. Because uh, if you do play move like b4, you're also running into things like rook d3. And, you know, Black does get some counterplay against the a3 pawn in that case. Um, and pushing the pawn doesn't really help. Because you can go like bishop d7 and, you know, either they play rook a1 or they play a5. But, yeah, either way, White's not really able to leverage the extra pawn into a... A strong pass pawn. So I mean, these calls are like just like being all thrown outside. Like I'm guessing some nice barbecue, but anyway, the game concluded. Ninety-five, king eight seven, and 
yeah, both sides just played it well, like this repeated moves where Ferusha also realized that he doesn't really have a, a great way to make progress here. So very balanced game. Like there was some tiny, tiny chance for White to try to get some small edge, but nothing too major really. Um, and so we get to what I think were the, really the two most interesting games of the round, where I'm kind of saving the best one for last, but I do want to also look at this game between Gukesh against Nepomnishi, because Gukesh definitely had some chances in this game, which actually it surprised me a little bit in a way, but, but we will get to that. So in the past, Nepo was often just playing bishop e7 and just playing these lines with dc4, um, and it's kind of modern approach he prepared for the World Championship match against Ding, uh, or against Carlson, I should say. Playing this Bishop E7, like, this is kind of the sort of martial equivalent against uh, against the Catalan, like, where you sack the pawn, but where Black gets this very good piece play, and it's quite hard for White to fully consolidate against the, the Black piece pressure. But in this game, Nepo plays something a little different. He goes for the move C5 and heads more into this semi-Tarash kind of territory. And it used to be thought that these positions were just a bit better for White, that, for example, after knight c6 and castles and bishop e7, you know, they'd just be able to either play knight c3 and play in the center, or, you know, we even just go takes and just get this very comfortable Catalan structure where White's bishop is kind of a lot better than Black's in a sense. But Nepo came with this idea of playing c takes d4, which I, I do like quite a bit here. Um, if knight d4, black has the option then to develop the bishop and just, you know, develop very, very quickly. So white decides to castle to avoid bishop b4 coming with a check. We had bishop c5, knight d4, castles. And, and this vision actually reminds me a little bit of a Grunfeld, a Fienkedo Grunfeld, but where instead of the bishop being on g7, the bishop is on c5. And this one, in, based on how the game played out, might be a tiny bit of a better version for white. But I think it doesn't make a huge difference. Knight b3 attacks the bishop. You know, he could go back to b6 or he could go back to e7. This one's a little bit more active, but does have the small disadvantage that that bishop may become a target to knight c4. So for this reason, Nepo played bishop to e7. And in the game, I was expecting that maybe Gukesh would go bishop d2 and just try to prepare knight c3 and, you know, get some some small initiative with the bishop, uh, bishops on the long diagonals in this way. I mean, black should still be able to defend, like, you move the queen, you play rook d8, bishop d7. I mean, black has no weaknesses in this structure, so white small edge will kind of be neutralized over time. So Kukesh played a little more ambitiously, going for the move e4, and then knight c3, you know, having this bit of extra space. The d3 square is not really a problem for us, because we're going to cover it soon with our pieces anyway. Um, game went knight 8 c6, bishop e3, queen takes d1, rook a takes d1. It's possible maybe I should have played a move earlier, just so I was forced to take with the f rook, but it doesn't make a big difference here. Uh, but what really impressed me about this game, even though it ended in a draw, is that Actually, Gukesh was kind of able to outplay his opponent a little bit from this phase of the game. Um, and I guess it's true, like, Nepo, yeah, probably is more comfortable in somewhat sharper positions than this one, or you know, is much more comfortable being the side press pressing here as white uh, rather than defending. But, yeah, in this case, Black played the move f6, and you now all these moves are kind of reasonable looking, but just somehow there was a small accumulation of tiny errors that sort of added up to white getting a pretty nice advantage, and... It may well be that here a5 maybe is the move for black to go a4 and, you know, kick the knight around to try to create some counterplay. But f6, yeah, we can't really call it a mistake either. The idea of rook f1 is, you know, to prepare bishop f1 to kick the knight and you know, maybe have some ideas with e5 as well to make something of white's extra space. Now, at this point, I think rook b8 as playing the game is probably not the most precise that... It's probably better just to play a move like rook d8 and just develop the piece in a more normal kind of fashion. Or even to play a move like a6 is also possible with the idea that bishop f1 can be met with b5 and you, you know, defend the knight this way to have a reasonable position. Um, no, I can still go for moves like e5 and, you know, try to set some problems by weakening black structure. But I think that black should have enough piece activity that you should be okay in, you know, with precise play. 
Even so, it is definitely easier to play white at this point. In the game after rook b8 and bishop f1, a uh, very nice move by Gukesh, and the point is that you don't have b5 anymore to defend the knight, because knight b5 is going to win a pawn we're removing the defender trick. So black was kind of forced into playing knight d6, and now with knight b5, white just traded off that knight and brought the, the bishop to a nice active square in. I mean, black's just quite passive, like the bishop on c8 still hasn't really entered the game, let's say, and you know, for this reason, maybe e5 and getting the bishop out this way might have been the play for black to minimize the disadvantage, because in the game after king f7, bishop e3, a6, and your b5 is probably easier to criticize and to offer a clear improvement, because if you do play e5 now, like one difference is f5 is a bit more effective than usual when you're sort of kicking the king and, you know, even g6, bishop h6, we can kind of feel how why it's able to sort of take the squares of black leaves in this case. So b5 is kind of, you know, preparing to develop the bishop or preparing to play e5. But it does also leave a nice outpost for the white knight, where you can see these sort of micro concessions steadily adding up here. We had rook d8, take, take. I mean, the one thing that's sort of positive about black's position is that at least it has a relatively small number of weaknesses in terms of weak pawns. But after king f2, there is still the question of how to get out of tricks like knight a6 and, and simply winning a pawn. And if you do try to move the knight, you know, why can you even just play like knight to, to d3, for example, and just trade the bishop and, you know, get the rook in. And, and black definitely has his work cut out to survive in a, in a position like this one, let's say, uh, where white will be, you know, clearly better. But in the game, black played bishop takes c5 which I think is the best chance, just get rid of the annoying knights. But then again, white does have the bishop pair advantage, and after king e3 and rook d8, I think we can say that this was probably Gukesh's best chance in the game, where once he missed this opportunity, I kind of felt that, you know, Nepomnitri would be able to draw this fairly comfortably, which is essentially what happened in the game. But a, a really nice idea for white in this position is actually to play the move a4 and to be fair there are other moves at a4 then a4 are still better for white but um the point is that after b takes a4 we can play the move rook to c4 and basically get the pawn back and not only do you get the pawn back but you also kind of get c4 for the bishop and the threat of f5 does make it quite difficult for black to defend uh like for example after rook a8 Bishop c4, like maybe it's not lost for black necessarily by fourth, but yeah, it's going to be very tough for black to hold this position with the very strong bishops and two pawn weaknesses that white can really latch on to here. Um, would have been very interesting to see how, how the game might have played out from here in, in reality, but in the game after bishop b6, rook d7, uh, funny enough, even here, like black you know, it's not too late actually to play to move a4. It's actually still very strong here. But this time that is not so much rook c4, but rather bishop c4. And this pawn sacrifice to prepare like f5 and use the pin is actually very nettlesome for black. Where, um, to give an idea, like the move that, like one move the engine suggests is to go knight d8 and try to defend that way. And then, you know, the, you know, the human move is probably just go rook a1 and just get the pawn back. But... The machine has this wild idea of playing the move b4, which first glance looks like black just takes on Passant and white is just, you know, blundering a pawn. But then we sort of get to here and we realize that actually there's no good way for black to get out of bishop a4. Um, like if they play king e7, we still go bishop a4 and, you know, they, they still get their, their rook trapped with bishop c5 or, or rook c7 and then bishop c5 is, is even better again. Um, but that's a really tough thing to see. Like, to see this B4 here is definitely very, very computerish. Like, it doesn't really follow any sort of human logic as far as I can tell. Um, that being said, yeah, I still think A4, yeah, you kind of... You can still play the move even if you see, like, Rook A1 in the worst case to get the pawn back and, you know, try to get at the, the A6 pawn. You know, it still does give White very decent winning chances. I think Rook D1 in the game, yeah, was just maybe a little bit too sort of a little bit too meek in a way. 
where white is still technically better, but it's just very hard to kind of break through in this position. And the Palmer shoot, I think, just defended it quite well. By putting pawn h5, you make it that white has to sort of exchange pawns in order to make any progress on the king's side. After b3, um, again, maybe bishop b6 and trying to go for a4 or bring the bishop to b3 might be a better try here. But yeah, after b3, bishop c8, we sort of got to a point in the game where yeah, basically once this this bishop gets out, black is just going to be doing fine. So Gukesh played f5, trying to make the structure more asymmetrical in the favor of the bishops. But king g7 was a good defense in the game. Um, note, by the way, that bishop e2 is, is not just very good here, because black does have this trick of knight a5 to counterattack the pawn. Uh, obviously, black's very happy if the pawns get traded, and this is also why we... We played king g7 as black, because otherwise bishop c4 would, would be a bit of a problem. But yeah, also an opposite color bishop bending would of course be a, a pretty ironclad draw as well here. The game ultimately concluded fg6, uh, bishop g4, nice little touch to avoid bishop e2 altogether. Bishop c2, bishop e6, and yeah, at this point it's, it's pretty clear that white's not going to be making any progress when the white pawns are now fixed on the light squares for our bishop. And so the, the draw was agreed at this point at the, well, the earliest possible time that the players could agree a draw. So I did say that we'd left the best for last, and the uh, final game is actually uh, an interesting one in that also, not just because of Prague's very dynamic opening choice of playing the, the delayed Janish or delayed Schliemann with F5 here, but also it means that there have actually been more games won with black than with white in this tournament. Uh, which is definitely a little bit surprising in a way. Um, if you're wondering what some of the differences are with this version and you know the immediate f5, well, one point is that if white plays knight c3 here, well, now this knight c3 system isn't as effective because you know d5 runs in a 95, but we can play b5 first and then d5 and just take over the center. So knight c3 becomes a lot less appealing for white, and yeah, well, I can still play d3, but once again, you know, the fact we've flicked in a6, it means that, for instance, d6 becomes a much more appealing option. Because in a lot of cases, white would rather put the bishop on c4 rather than a4. But bishop g3 just doesn't really have that same ring to it when we can, you know, go after their bishop pair and, and neutralize the pressure. Something that isn't so feasible when their bishop is on c4 and can, you know, still move back along this diagonal as such. So it's a kind of the subtleties that sort of would make this a better version for black. Except that the move d4 is considered to be very, very strong for white, according to the conventional theory. After ed4, I should explain, by the way, if fe4, knight e5, that this would actually be pretty strong for white. It is a version where you'd much rather have the bishop on b5, actually. Um, just to put it on the board, just so you guys can see it. You know, if we have a position like this something I have played a bit with the white pieces online, but as a bit of a surprise weapon, but the move c6 is a problem here though, where if the bishop moves, there is queen a5, and yeah, we can see that black doesn't have this resource in, in this version here, which is why Prague instead played e d4, uh, e5, b5, bishop b3, and now knight a5, yeah, very much in the style of the Norwegian defense, getting rid of this bishop, because... If we're not able to cast our king to safety, we can't really claim that, that the position is playable. But yeah, knight d4, bishop e7, and, and this is where things get kind of interesting in a way. Because so far this has only been played in one master game uh, in uh, 2021, uh, with Johan Sebastian Christensen playing as black. Uh, but I think this game is a bit of a surprise to Vidic. You know, we can see he's already used like 25 minutes on the clock where... Uh, if we go back, yeah, we can see even d4, he spent quite a bit of time even on, you know, on this move, on move 5 as such. But yeah, knight f5 is a very natural move, but based on how the game played out, grabbing the pawn's probably not the, the optimal choice for white, let's say. Um, a move like castling might seem very natural, but it is true that you are sacrificing a piece with c5 and c4, so you can, you know, understand a little bit why, why Vidit wasn't so keen to go for this even though the engines will say that the white is better here with this sort of attack very much in the style of the Mora Gambit. Um, but a more practical approach also could be something like knight c3 here, 
where, you know, the c5 and c4 is considerably less effective when we can play like queen g4 and, you know, just flood the piece in the attack in this sort of way. But yeah, instead, um, you know, black's not going to play c5. They're probably just going to go takes and then play it in a similar way to the game, like d6. And, you know, white's probably a little bit better with best play, but black gets a kind of sharp position that he was looking for from the start to sort of get a fight and to play for a win, even with the black pieces. Um, which is something with Prague, you know, also he's a very well prepared player and, you know, quite good at sort of creating chances out of the opening with both colors, uh, as we also saw with some of his earlier games. After knight takes f5, takes, it's it's worth pointing out that you don't want to play bishop takes g2. This would be a bit of a suicidal pawn grab, as after we move the bishop away, white will just play queen h5 and, you know, basically just murder black here with rook g6. You know, take queen g6 is checkmate after all. So black played the move d6 instead. This is the point of black's play to sacrifice a pawn, but to get some quite nice play with the bishop there. And, you know, the bishop has a really great diagonal here for sure. White played the move queen e2 in the game, where the first point to note is that ed6 is, is not all that appealing after queen d7. Um, if queen d3, g6, and you, you know, black basically regains the pawn and just has very good compensation with the bishop pair advantage and, and very active piece play in a uh, in a situation like this one. Uh, and you can play some more moves, but I think you, you get the idea that black is is going to be very happy in a, in a position like this in general. Uh, one way white could have played it is he could have played the move queen h5, and, you know, if he just wanted to sort of end the game and, you know, get out of this, this awkward situation, he could play this sequence, and, you know, it looks a bit weird to sack the knight, but the idea is that, you know, black is not going to have a way out of the out of the perpetual check in this case. Um, you know, king c6, surprisingly enough, is actually not losing by force, but you are kind of, yeah, leaving your king in a very awkward position. I will admit that this is a little bit of a computerish continuation where, you know, I think a move like castling and, you know, playing knight c3 is probably the most practical, just like, I mean, black's going to be fine here, but, you know, you develop, you play an ending, and, you know, you see what happens. Whereas queen e2, yeah, is trying to punish black a little bit more for his opening choice, but after queen d7, it turns out black is already just fine. Like, you don't even really care that much if they take a pawn with check, because your rook is going to be coming in and just giving you very nice piece play once again. So white plays a move e6, sort of shoving the pawn in black's face. That being said, the pawn also kind of serves a bit of a shield for the bat black king, while black kind of gets coordinated. If black can, you know, get a move like knight e7 and castle, he's going to be, you know, pretty comfortable here. So Vidit played this move with bishop g5, trying to make it hard for black to get his king castle. Then, you know, note as well that queen g2 would be a bit of a blunder because it takes, takes, and, and here black would get mated. So that's not really something that you want to allow here. But of course, black didn't fall for this. He played the intermezzo of g6 first to avoid that after knight e3 defending the pawn on g2 black played h6 just kicking away the pieces if bishop h4 black has a nice little trick of queen e4 to fork the bishop and the pawn to get the pawn back and basically have a slight advantage with the the bishop pair once uh you know once black gets his pieces developed so i plays bishop f4 instead uh funnily enough queen e4 is still a move here but Black played the move 97, going for a bit more of a, a dynamic approach, just maximizing development rather than cashing in the chips early. Because we can see here that this pawn is very well blockaded by the knights, with b4 not letting white get that knight to the dream d5 square. We had queen g4, queen c5, and I mean, Prague just kind of, you know, outplayed white for, you know, most of the rest of the game. And, you know, the fact that you have the time advantage in a very sharp position also helps quite a lot. Um, you know, the idea of queen c5, in case it wasn't clear, is we're just basically, you know, avoiding any stuff like knight d5, because now the, the bishop is covering it. Um, so that's quite useful. After castles, bishop g7, knight d2. Yeah, there's a position where you can probably just play simple chess, just castle and, you know, bring the rooks around. And, you know, once you round up this pawn, black's going to be very, very comfortable with his bishop pair advantage. The move long castle is a bit more optimistic, where... You know, objectively speaking, it was not, not such a great move. 
but white has to play quite precisely in order to show it where the move white has to find here which he he didn't find in the game is is the move of knight to d5 the point being you don't really want to trade off your bishop and weaken your king but if you do play knight d5 white will go e7 check and it turns out that actually white has a pretty strong initiative after knight e4 where you know already there are some some tricks in the air let's say uh with uh for example like queen c6 might seem very natural but then I've take take why I can play knight d6 and rook fc1 and you know it turns out that you know according to the computer white is is winning here with this you know this monster attack but I like queen e4 rook e1 and you can promote but yeah this is a very difficult variation of course like a lot of very you know unnatural intermediate moves being featured in in this case so definitely one for the computers but it's also instructive yet to see how how it plays out um, you know, the other difficult point is like if knight f6 that white can now take and go rook e1 and you know, again it turns out that white's able to get the piece back with an initiative because yeah rook e8 does run into queen g6 and you know rook e7 takes we will we will get the piece back one way or another here uh but like i said yeah very difficult variation to see and i can't really blame both players for missing this sort of computerish resource um, but I mean, Rook E1 would be arguably a more normal move, let's say. Uh, but in the game, H4 was played trying to avoid G5 ideas. Fair enough, even here, G5 is still possible to pawn sack to open up the white king. Um, turns out you can technically get away with Bishop B2 and just grab a pawn, but the move in the game of Rook D8 was also quite fine, just keeping the control over the position and, yeah, sort of taking a sting out of the aforementioned Knight D5. After rook 81, bishop b2, you no know, white did actually find the idea of, of knight d5 in this position. But it turns out to be not as effective when you don't have that e7 intermediate attack on the on the d8 rook. Where now it's it's more going to be pleasant for black where the e6 pawn is coming under fire. You know, now it's actually black who's a pawn up and has the bishop, so it's uh it's a tough gig for white, and you know, probably rook e1 gives the the best chances to hold here, but you know, here white can probably survive, but it, it's of course still very messy. Uh, but the game saw e7 instead, which, yeah, it's going to be a lot less effective here compared to the version we saw before. After bishop b3, queen b5, you know, black is, is up a pawn and he's covering himself pretty well here. Knight c4, bishop c3, just keeping everything anchored very nicely. Bishop d4 was played, and yeah, in this position here, I think that... Well, you don't really want to take and, and just help white bring the queen to a better square in a sense, but turns out the move rook h7 would have been quite strong, just from tending to take back here with the rook on along this way. Because um, if white does play queen g6, you're just able to just have this very strong attack down the g file that's, that's pretty hard for white to deal with. In many ways, a position like this kind of reminds me a bit of the the bot Phoenix semi-slav, where you sort of give up a lot of the king side pawns. But you get this queenside pawn armada and this very nice piece play to make up for it. Except here, of course, it's, it's very much amplified. Still, rook h8, yeah, maybe technically it throws away the advantage, but, you know, white still has to play quite precisely in order to, to hold this position. And a move like knight a3 is just by the computer is, of course, not the, not the first move most people think of. Uh, like, when I was looking, it's actually originally misread as knight e3. Like, my brain just auto-corrected going to put the knight in the center because well normally that's what you should do but it's just not a normal position in a sense but instead play queen d4 looking to get the pawn on c3 but after bishop b7 queen c3 and rook e7 you know we can see that the black is going to be better here with the extra pawn um the move of knight a5 kind of shows why putting the bishop on a8 was a little bit better just so the knight isn't isn't hitting the, the bishop like so but yeah, the game went rookie five, and you know here White actually is probably doing not so badly. In fact, if he takes and plays rook d four, where you know sort of the weakness of Black's king kind of makes up somewhat for the the extra pawn Black has. Like Black is still better. Like you can go g five and you know, try to use this as a hook, but you know I can also keep things stable and you know keep the the Black advantage to a minimum at least. But in the game, b four was played and. You know, that allows black time for g5 and getting things moving on the king side. h5 was played in the game, but that's now less effective. 
is g4 and we can you know, pick up the pawn this way rook fe1 uh and black found a very very nice move to basically ensure himself a winning position he played the move of g3 at this point just ripping open that black king and bringing the rook on g8 into the game uh if fg6 black will just play queen to b6 and you know if you can't even move the king here because of mate and you know king f1 and and rook f eight's no good either, so yeah, it all just falls apart for white. Uh, you can't block on d4 because then the rook on e1 is on. So yeah, basically white's already losing, and then the game knight v7 was played. But you know now we can see that it's white who has the the much more exposed king in this position. Um, the game ultimately concluded queen f3, rook e g5, and even though white may actually get to an ending that's kind of where the good news ends because black is about to win a second pawn the game ending g4 take rook e6 rook h4 take rook g5 so just rounding up the pawn not giving white any sort of counterplay rook h7 take rook d7 and we can see yeah black is just not giving white the time to to create swindling chances with rook c1 and after rook g7 rook hf5 yeah the rook will get swapped off and the and the pawn ending will be an easy win, or the rook ending will be an easy win. So for this reason, white resigned here. Yeah, this was, I think, a, a quite fun round. Like, even some of the the drawn games had some interesting moments to them. And, you know, this game with Prague was, of course, very exciting, very complicated. And it means that after the conclusion of this round that, yeah, we now have, you know, this small change of leaderboard of Vidit, you know, no longer being in the, the equal lead. But you still have, you know, Caruana... And the Pomnishi and Gukesh still on that score of, you know, two out of, of three. There will be another round as well tomorrow where I, I don't remember what the what the pairings are for that fourth round. But yeah, you'll you'll see it in the in the next recap in any case. Um do let me know in the comments below what was your favorite part of this video or you know the favorite move or game that, that you saw here. Uh definitely interested to, to hear your thoughts on that. And as always, if you are interested in having private lessons with me, I do have a, a couple of spots still available. So feel free to reach out to me via messenger or email. I've got the, the links for that in the description below. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the, the next recap. Until then, take care.